and I pulled up in that M5 at the front of the bank and ran in, sledgehammered the safe open, took you know, a large amount of money and the whole time we were watched by police. That was the nature of Redfern in itself and how normalised that was and no, there was no fear or anything of that nature. All that talk to my gang pulled up and we pull up and they all did. Yo, it's your boy King Dave here and this is The Felon Show. Hope all is going well. What's your name and where you from, my bro? My name is Jeffrey Morgan. I am from Everly Street, Redfern, Sydney, Australia. Everly Street, Redfern, man. So he's from the block here, man, straight out of Sydney. Um, good to have you on, my brother. Uh, man, I remember watching you on NITV, man, when I was over there in the clink, man. You used to um, take all your advice on all your training strategies and all of that, man. That's crazy. <laughs> so Jeff here is the creator of his own uh, online fitness program. He's also hosted his own show on NITV. He's uh, got a story of redemption. He has done a bit of time. Um, you know, he's gone from bank robber to TV host, um, online creator. So it's just, it's awesome to see, man, um, an inspiration. Um, Thanks, brother. I mean, first of all, man, so so Morgan, so that's a pretty big mob, isn't it? So I've, I've done a time with a, with a few Morgans in, um, in Victoria, Mr. Morgs, the rapper and all of that. I was, uh, I knew I knew a lot of them. So um, yeah, quite a big family, isn't it? Massive family. We've got, I've got eight brothers two sisters and um, no doubt in custody as well. A lot of Morgans, um, not only in Sydney, but also in Melbourne and doing time yeah. in both New South Wales and um, Victoria. Uh, I was able to meet a lot of my family um, probably the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> Would have rather done it over coffee or, or family get together, but it, it, was, it is what it is. And as you said, you know, um, we're in a position now where we travel globally uh, delivering mental health and wellbeing programs, you know, to schools, juvenile justice centres, jails, corporate organisations, communities, um, sporting teams to really talk about those habits that you have. And they, it doesn't have to be around crime. It could be anything and literally how you transition into the best, healthiest, fittest, happiest, most successful version of yourself. And that all came from, you know, the upbringing of where I was and where I am now. So. Wow, wow. Man, I just got shivers down my spine. You saying that, brother? Got the jollies now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, not taking the piss, brother, but yeah, so obviously, you know, was growing up, did you see a lot of um aunties, uncles, cousins and that, you know, um end up in custody and things? Was that sort of a common sight Absolutely. for you? Red, red from the block, to give context for people that don't understand or know the block in general from anywhere across the globe. Um, it was probably Australia's most notorious street at one stage and, you know, police wouldn't drive down there, otherwise they'd get ripped out of the car, bricks would get thrown into the car and the car would get burnt, just as an example of the type of area that it was and um, a lot of bank robbers come from there, a lot of crime came from there. Um, it was a destructive community and I mean that in the nicest way, but in, in saying that it was also a very strong and tight-knit community for the right reasons back then and... <clears throat> um, you know, Uncle Zani's community was a badge of honour to go to, you know, go into custody as such. And there's no real fear behind it. It was just a matter of survival and that's the way you did it. And unfortunately, that became an entrenched behaviour, you know, a habit and ritual that I had for a long time. And um, I took that on and really tried to excel at everything I did around in that nature. You know, survival was um, the, the first thing we ever got, we ever did. We broke into something to actually eat me and my brother and we we're sitting there eating red we were eating food and we seen a packet of red frogs i was 12 years of age and i said red frogs sound good to me for dinner and we opened a packet and there was no red frogs but there was bundles of money and i was like wow this is you know something that i can do more often and if this is what i'm going to find when i do it let's go out and do that because sleeping on a bedroom of a house with 13 people and you know, depending on what time you got in would de depend on how much of that bed you got, as an example, and laying on the lino floor and having rats and, and cockroaches crawl, crawl over you because that was just normal, totally normal within the community. Look, man, who were some of your role models, man, coming up around Redfern and um, who were the guys that sort of really looked up to, man? Yeah, like we had Anthony Mundine, obviously, at the time, you know, playing at St. George. You know, we had um, a lot of other black brothers, Wes Patton, um, who was playing um, at the time at Balmain, Robbie Simpson at St. George South. 
Um, and a lot of these blokes, because it was distract, so destructive, right? And same thing, I end up at South with um, uh, and Daryl Trindle, who was at South. I end up at South myself, and oh, okay, um, yeah, yeah. Day, you know, I literally walked out of training one day because I just knew my path. You know, I was staying up till four in the morning, going out doing ram raids in Porsches, as the example. Um, and, and you know, like for us, that was just a normal life. And then trying to show up next morning, early in next morning, to do your first strength and conditioning session at six a.m. or whatever it was, and then going back at three o'clock in the afternoon or whatever time it was in the afternoon to do another one, and then going out that night again to do some more ram raids. It was just insane. And um, you know that I just ended up walking out of training one day, and I think you know. It was a missed opportunity, but at the same time, let's try and work on the next kid that goes through that process and um, journey because, you know, the same skills, I always say this to everyone, you, as you would know too, brother, the, the business skills acronym over here, the um, effort, we, I stayed up 24 hours and no doubt you've probably done it yourself where you've gone out on the, you know, trying to make that, uh, make an earn or set up an earn for the the, the process and i think people don't understand how how hard we actually worked in the background to achieve what we wanted to achieve now if we take those same principles in, and transfer them into business we can be very successful at whatever we do because not many people are going to grind like we have and that's a great habit to really have 15 years over 15 years for me in total um, in custody you know, or in as an e2 so i never got out of maximum really um oh. And that, you know, a lot of segro in that where you just sit there in your own brain and own thoughts and, and really thinking about, you know, it got to a point where I really thought about what I wanted out of my life. I was locked up in Victoria and I just got convicted of, or got found guilty, I should say, of an, um, bank robbery down there. And that, you know, at that point, I was sitting in the um, Port Phillip um, in segro and that sort of really started to, tick off on my mind I'd obviously done a lot more thought process behind that and I think that's where the change started to happen I came out of there bumped into a bloke who offered me a uni degree and I was like hey how do I get it done and the rest is history when did when did um you know prison and all of that stuff were you man how old did you uh were you when you first went to prison yeah I was uh, I was 14 um I went to boys homes uh Yasma which was um in Sydney in the heart of Sydney Ashfield and um, took off from there, escaped a few times um, on my journey through boys' homes. Didn't like being locked up, obviously, and just didn't fathom, like, didn't put it all together. <laughs> I look back on it now and it's, you, know, you just can't believe what you went through, eh? But as I said, just survival skills, you know, and that transition over time from, you know, those escapes going to, um, Patterson House is an example where you, you can't get out of, um, oh, I shouldn't say you can't get out of, but end up taking off, a lot of people have taken off from there as well. <clears throat> but in general, that just transitioned into, you know, the, the person I was. And as an E2 prisoner um, within the maximum security jails of Sydney, um, as the example, or New South Wales, it was just a, just a normal part of the process, catching up with the boys that were locked up at the time and, you know, there's no fear behind it. There's no um, thought process around it. You just sort of sit back and go, this is all part of, you know, my life and I'm just going to have to get better at it. And that's what we did over time. You know, things started out from, as I said, breaking into the survival to eat to a um, life of, you know, real high-end breaking in it. Um, thinking about warehouses, taking a huge amount of stuff, you know, like that could be there as an example through to and the stuff I'm talking about I've been charged for, um, to stealing Porsches, ram raiding at nights, um, being known as that crew and um, then transitioning into um, bank snatches, snatching money money off counters as an example. And people just can't even fathom me doing that. But that was just the survival skills into bank robberies itself and um, that transition. It was just so smooth, so... When I say that, I don't say that um, with a big head or anything of that nature. But to, to think about a person that goes through that um, transition and doesn't think about it and you know, has no fear of being shot or to anything of that, it's just insane you know, to sit out the front of a bank knowing that um, you're about to do something or just pulling up and running in 
like nothing matters. Um, you know, it's crazy after the last one in Melbourne, we were, we were being watched. Um, and I, we got to a point where I, I said to him, hey, I think we'll, sh-, you know, I've seen this same car twice over. And the boys are like, mate, you're tripping out. Stop worrying about it. And I'm like, mate, I'm telling you, pulling into this driveway, the car even falls into the driveway down the end of these villas. And I said, I told you we're being watched. Let's call it a day. We'll, we'll get done for the car. And um, no, nah, went ahead with it the next next day and you know, pulled up in that M5 at the front of the bank and um, ran in, sledgehammered the safe open, took you know, a large amount of money. And the whole time we were watched by police come out, got chased by a motorbike, bike on a motorbike. And I kept saying, mate, that bloke rode too well. He was a copper, I'm telling you. And no, no, you're tripping out. And, and the next thing we get back to the hotel, we go into town and we do some shopping in Melbourne, like nothing's happened. And um, we're in Foot Lock and all of a sudden, you know, the, the old um, man in black come in, running in and um, down on the ground in front of everybody. And that was the last time I was arrested, you know. And, and oh, what year was that? That was 2003. Um, so seven years for that. Yeah, 10 years wow. with seven on the bottom. So for those that don't know, you serve seven years. And then three years, um, depending on how good you were, obviously for me, I was doing my bachelor's and my head was down and I was up working you know, to create change. But um, to look back on something like that and just think, you know, we knew we were under surveillance. And we were very lucky at the time we um, looked at another bank. So they'd set up at the other bank and next thing we were robbing the other bank and um, we're just lucky that we weren't where they'd set up because we would have walked out to, you know, a bunch of police. Yeah. Um, who knows what would have happened at that point in time, I think. Yeah. You know, life's got a strange way of looking after yourself. $50,000 was unaccounted for with from our robbery oh. once they recovered the money because obviously they arrested us at that point in time and, um, the old, you know, don't say anything, even, uh, you know, they, they wanted to know if the police were corrupt and we were just like, mate, we don't know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Off you go. And the rest is history. But obviously 50,000 didn't just walk out the door of the um, motel by itself, especially what we were doing like in, in the back end of our, or even bank snatches as, a, as a, an example. We do those on foot and we do them in our own car. Um, back in the day and you know to be able to do that and i'll talk about this because i got charged for a bunch of them together in one day because we got filmed in the stolen car um at the end of the day and we've done a whole bunch of them throughout the whole day where we pull up just walk into a bank you know give a bit of a signal snatch money being deposited back then um and run off you know and you get huge amounts of money um from that counter I suppose as a younger kid, you know, you might get 50 grand in one little snatch and be able to get away with that as an example very easily. And we had a whole day where I got charged for a whole bunch of them. Unfortunately, got filmed by a TV crew finishing up. And I, you had to be fit to run off from those you know, those things. And our crew would get together and train um, together as a unit. And just literally, you know, as I said, I always took things really serious and really um, bunk it down and make sure that I didn't want to sit in that cell or in that yard um, telling yarns about how good we were while we sat in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a good look. When I first went in, I'd say it wasn't as, you know, they looked after you, I suppose, m- mob or, you know, um, family, I suppose, Aboriginal um, community looked after yourself. As And then by... The 90s, I'd say, we started to see a lot more segregation. Aboriginals here, Islanders there, and so forth. I think I watched John Killick's interview the other day. You could have a you know a fair dig or a crack at one another fight, for those that don't know. And that would be the end of it. You'd be playing you know, cards or something later on together, busted up. <laughs> and um, that, that would be the end of it. These days, it's totally different. It's, you know, if this person fights with this person in their particular race, and that, you know, mini sort of war and you can feel that tension within the yard and in that world, you know, as you know, respect is everything, okay, and how you treat somebody. If you want to disrespect someone, then you better make sure that you're ready to throw down. And I think that's the hardest thing for most people. Um, 
finding a, a good balance when they first go in. And I was able to do that because, you know, our community, our Aboriginal community really looked after one another and told me what I should or shouldn't be doing. And um, that made it an easy transition. I came straight out of boys' homes. I was still in boys' homes, actually. And the same thing, I took the wrap. Someone had walked past and thrown a little sticker pot, $20 sticker pot, and I'd caught it and kept walking the other way, right? He was getting um, taken up to be searched. And they realised that he, once they searched him, he didn't have it on him. They, he must have gave it to me somehow. And then grabbed me and bef- as I walked into the uh, thing, I got they wouldn't say anything, got convicted of it. And I was 18 at the time. I didn't realise. And they took me straight from boys' home to Long Bay. I served three months and then went back to boys' homes to serve out the rest of the time for those bank snatches that I spoke about before. And, um, and during that process, as I said, I was very well looked after, and that made you know me not fear jail in that sense because I was like, you know, I know people there, I know the community there, and I know the boys are going to look after myself. And um, that's you know where somehow if people do want to create that change, it's not going to happen in that process because you, you, you're throwing kids under the bus, and I think. Um, and being able to uh, maybe show them some role modelling. I didn't have that as a kid. Um, I did, but I just, I suppose the environments you're in and so forth, there's a whole heap of factors, but they're, they're not being considered. When I look at the system at the moment, I think that's where they fall over and um, they'll, they'll continue to fall over. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, with the respect thing or finding that balance when you go to prison, you know, for people that have been inside, it's also finding that balance when you get out, you know what I mean? Because you can be offended easily, you know what I mean? When, um, Absolutely. you know, I found that when I was released, you know, it's sort of um, finding that balance of when people are just joking around and, you know what I mean? And not taking it personally and just, you know. Absolutely. That's your ego too. Yeah, no, that's, exactly. That's your ego too, right? Yeah, yeah, but, and, yeah. and as as you know, in there, if someone attacks your ego, you got to stand up because if you don't, then you look at upon as being weak. And as you said, once you get out, if someone hits you in the same posse, which is your ego, you're going to bounce out, you know, and people are like, oh, whoa, man, it's yeah. quite joking. And you're like, mate, don't, you know, if you want to stand up and, and put your chest out, mm. I'll put mine out just as, as loud. And people do um, freak out by that. And I've learned over time how to curtail that and really. Yeah pull my head back in and mm. I think I did that even whilst I was in custody and I'd just be able to deal with people um, in a different way and still show them, hey, look, I'll stand up for myself. But at the same time, we can come out of this better. And I think that being a delegate, uh, as an Aboriginal delegate, as an example, within the jail system helped me um, probably stop a lot of violence going on within that jail. And, and as the officers would not have known, sometimes they would have known, um, between groups, between people, and uh, and when I say they would have known, they would have just known that this, you know, this was about to jump off, and all of a sudden it, it dispersed, yeah. and I was the you know the the common denominator in the middle of the, the conversation. I'm pretty sure they had respect. Um, and I, you know, same thing. It was just about all of us doing our time as easy as we could without having to look over our shoulders every single minute of the day. Um, as you know, it, it becomes a, a your, your anxiety levels your um, you're constantly on guard, and I think that's you know, you, and that's something that I still do to this day. I, I feel you know, that you can't, you're so aware of your environment, people behind you, people, and it's just yeah, and that alone in itself something that um, needs to be addressed for people that do get out and obviously get in that uh, position. And that's something we do hugely with um, organisations, or you know, New, New South Wales Juvenile Justice as an example. So, I mean, yeah, to, to go back to your story a little bit. So, w- w- when did things um, escalate to banks and, and robbing banks um, for you? I got charged in 1997 for um, Commonwealth Bank in um, South Hurstville. And long story short, I wasn't even, I was meant to go and um, probably, what's the word? I'd be a consultant for a bank robbery, like literally. Um, I'd 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 gone out that weekend and I'd partied quite hard and I was pretty damaged. So I was like, "Look, man, I'll you know I'll just I'll tell you how it goes down and what you should be doing." And I, I they pretty much begged me, "Please, but just come sit in another car, but just tell us the whole way and describe it all." 
I said, all right, I'll come with you, but I'm going to sit in the car. And I had the bloke's missus, as you know, a bit of a cardinal sin as well, you know, bringing the missus along. And But I was in another car totally, not near him the whole lot. Um, and, you know, I'd given a fake name to her and I was just like really wary about it all, but I was a bit seedy and I was, they were going to kick me a bunch of money for, for helping them out. And then that next thing you know, they're like, mate, we don't know how to get it open. Can you come in quickly? So I pulled the shirt over my head, ran in, wearing the same clothes that I'd left that day. Oh, wow. We come out of it. Yeah, well, it's just stupid. I was in shorts and a T-shirt. I pulled the thing over my head, done my little shirt up, so you could only see the slit of my eyes. But it didn't matter. I was in the same clothes. And because of what we did, we were constantly under surveillance, honestly. I, I reckon like there was ten a 10-year period where I don't think oh, there was a day I didn't see a surveillance unit. Then, you know, even then you get so paranoid about every car as well, and it just becomes a really – heavy toll on the brain constantly and um come out of the bank come oh i went into the safe we smashed open the safe we took the money and when i came out because i looked two blokes were standing there you go mate you're gone now and i was like what do you mean i'm going to use your mate to the left you know i said mate if you don't move out of the way did what i did got out of the bank got to the car the car wasn't starting they hadn't put petrol in brother the car was empty on petrol on a on a bank robbery so it was it was just a schmozzle of a day and we ended up taking off and we we you know we got to a position where people said jump out let's jump out now and other people were like no no stay in and we'll yeah um and then i stayed in um a couple of them jumped out unfortunately um we were talking in the back, me and oh, I was in the front. I was talking to the bloke in the back. Next thing, mate, I looked up. The bloke was speeding. I said, slow down, mate. You got away. It's all sweet now. Once once we, we just park the car and go from here. Next thing, I look up and I go, hey, mate, you're speeding. Settle it down. We don't want to bring attention. Highway patrol goes past. Does a U-turn for the speeding offence. And the rest was history, man. And served five, five years for that in 1997. And, um got out in uh, 2002 and, you know, um, went on a little rampage and back in, in 2003 for the seven years. So I served 12 years really quickly and consecutively, unfortunately. Mm. Um, wow. um, so that was when you went to Melbourne. What, 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 what took you down to Melbourne? Um, more just to obviously, I don't know, like I suppose just trying to, not to be seen as much. I think in Sydney we were very well known for what we were doing and our, our MO and we were using um, in their works, not mine, um, high-performance vehicles to get away, and whether it was M5s, AMGs, or something of that nature, um, um, it became very obvious that it, there's a particular crew. And then the area started to become well, it was one of the most notorious areas. There was bank robber after bank robber, and people would literally come down there and meet up um, just to go out and do a bank robbery. And it's, it's insane when you think back to something of that nature. Um, you know, people that came through the system and you heard their stories and hence why I'm able to talk about that, um, that they'd been charged for. They'd all meet down at Ripper. I mean, it's just insane. Everyone would come down, you know, people would meet for coffee, we'd meet for bank robberies or, or you know, uh, criminal offences. And I think um, that was the nature of Redfern in itself and how normalised that was. And no, there was no fear or anything of that nature. And over the years, no doubt, people got... Um, damage, whether it was by police, security, armor guard officers um, being shot, um, some unfortunately not making it through. And, um, you know, you hear the stories and it's just, you still go out like nothing was going to happen. It's just a normal day of, you know, if you're worked at, you're working nine to five working day. And I think when you look at it, like that is just insane that we can be, be built that way. But it's just because a byproduct of that environment and that survival mode comes on. All right. So, yeah, so you've ended up in Melbourne um, yep. getting caught for, for – well, how long had you been out of prison by that point? I think I was out a year, a year by, a year by that point. Yeah, mm-hmm. about a yearish, and um, went back into custody, unfortunately. And, um, yeah, that – same thing i didn't need to go down there at that point in time but um a couple of the crew came past and the rest is history we ended up down there and um yeah it was it, it was just 
there was so many signs not to do some stuff from the get-go and continuously um, knowing that we were being followed was one of those. And it was like, man, we're 100% under surveillance. And like, we're in Melbourne, we're sweet, nothing. You know, no coppers, no one's here. And I said, mate, all I have to do is pass on the information. I'm telling you, we've been followed. And, and there was, on, I could to this day, a green Calais with bird shit on the back window. And I was like, mate, this Calais following us and it's got bird shit on the back window. I've seen it twice now. And like you're tripping out. And we've seen it, you know, pretty far distance. And I said, here's that same Calais. I bet you it's got bird shit on the back. We drove up the back of that villa, as I spoke about. And we still went out and did it. We still went, you know, and we got to the car and there was a van with black tinted windows. And I said, boys, listen. This, this, you know, I think it's time to call it off. We'll go down for the car and whatever else. I'm happy to do that, but I just reckon we're under surveillance, and I think it's time to call it. And um, I think, you know, just getting out of Sydney, thinking that we were not going, we were going to be um, not as known or not as seen, was was the um, idea behind it. But you know, from what we now know from the get go, we were under surveillance, and you know, they knew that we were there, and. They had us on camera at the hotel. They had us on camera. Um, at that point, the boys jumped into the car. And I remember saying, hey, look, I'm going to make it clear as day. I'll take the Tarago, which is the rental car. I'm going to drive it up the back there. You're going to stay on the phone to me. And if anything goes down, I'm out. I'm going to, you know, hit the fences. And um, they were like, yeah, sweet, man. We'll take the car. And sure enough, at trial, you know, that van was had a camera in it. And pictured both of those jumping into the, the actual M5 just before the robbery and the rest was history. They had to plead guilty straight away. I pleaded not guilty because I I wasn't in any of the pictures other than being at the hotel and I said I'd only gone there at the hotel and they dropped me off at Turak, which was seen on camera. Um, but I got convicted because that van I spoke about, I parked at a point and they filmed me from a distance and it was like a man in the desert, but I'd thrown – jacket that I had on and and same thing right came down to the old clothing again I grabbed the jacket and I threw it in the back seat now you could see that that person you can't see the person but it throws up the jacket in the back seat the jacket was a Nordica jacket and it was very rare and they said I was wearing it at the hotel and it was in the back seat so the inference was the person was me mm-hmm. and I was around the crew and, and the rest was history but you know like thinking that you can go to another state or something of this nature, I think with the technology they got, they got. and the crew that I, I did stuff with have recently been convicted again. I moved on and I wish them all the very best and I didn't know anything of the, the nature of what they did and if they chose to go down that path and obviously they did, just being convicted and got, I think, I think it's 14 or 16 years with um, 12 years on the bottom, so pretty decent whack. and. Mm. You know, they still ring up and I still have time for them and you know, each to their own, it's a free world. I choose to live this pathway, but if you choose to live that pathway, as long as they don't cross over and I get myself in trouble, I'm cool to say hello, grab a coffee, whatever it may be, yeah, and I still yeah. look after the boys. Next year, something big about the blow-up for myself on a TV level. That's all I can oh, say. Nice. That's all I can say here first. Nice. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, boys will sit there and go, fire out, man, on you, Jeff, on you, Jeff. Just know that um, people will always judge you, and people will, but that's on them. Who you are then, who I was then, and who I am now is two different people. But at the same time, I'll never forget where I come from, and I'll always be there for everybody that comes from that journey as well, that there is a different way, and they can use their skills in, in a different way to still make that money that they want to make and live the life that they want to live. Just on um, on a, on a level where you're not getting thrown down by the men in black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More often than not, because it's not a good adventure, as you know. Yeah, uh, most definitely. No. And um, yeah, I definitely feel you there, man. There's still, even though you know I've got my path in life now, you know I definitely do have a lot of people I still have time for. You know what I mean? That are yeah. still in their life. And it's, it's hard, you know, when I see them because I do see them and I'm just like, man, you got so much potential outside of that world. You know what I mean? It's all about exactly what you said, you know, applying what you've learned and using it out here. You know, like even Absolutely. though I regret going to prison and, you know, getting deported from Melbourne and all of that, that has g- given me tools. You know what I mean? That people that haven't been to prison will never have. You know what I mean? They'll never Absolutely. have those, those sorts of tools, you know, that we can use in this world out here. You know what I mean? Um, 
definitely being bold is one of them. You know what I mean? Fortune favors Absolutely. the bold and um, not having any fear and to take risks in, you know, in a legit sense. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It, it, it definitely helps. Absolutely. Like there's so many skills, eh? And, you know, that fear, you got to think about, people ask me, did you have fear when you did stuff? And I was like, never, man. I never had fear. And that taught, you know, just as one lesson to people, to be able to step into any challenge, you know, and say, all right, what do we do and how do we do it? And if mm. there's never ever a mistake, I never ever looked at yeah. those times that I served, you know, oh, shit, I made a mistake, so I'm going to serve seven years. It was more, more, and I mean this in the nicest way to people that watch this, what was the lessons I learned to be better at the next opportunity when I would do, Robert, the, the next bank as the example, in that mode? And the same principle applies with anything within life. I, I It pops up all the time, hey, you know, you've got a record. And, and I'm like, mate, who I was then and who I am now, that's on yourself. If you want to judge me, I, I'm not. I'm comfortable with who I am, and that's a that's a big tip to anyone changing your life. You're gonna run into people who will constantly judge you, but um, don't let their version of you define who you actually are. Wake up and know who you are when you look in that mirror. Um, for sure, you know, and it's all about the inner work. You know what I mean? Finding out who you are, because I mean, um, it isn't it isn't that doesn't happen overnight. You know what I mean? Going from a you know an ex crook to um you know, moving forward from that life, you know, it is a process, you know, there is a bit of depression involved, a bit of, you know, being lost, you know, thinking, um, you know, what am I going to do now, you know, after all of that, but you just got to dig deep, you know what I mean, you got to dig deep, stick your feet in, and, um, you know, um, soldier forward. There's a lot of depression behind that, and a lot of, you know, inbuilt, people think we just don't care, but we're humans in the end, and as I said, a lot of it just came from survival, but you take on, you know, being locked in a cell, people don't understand. And if you go to Segro as an example, and you're sitting in a cell with absolutely nothing in that cell for months on end, and you come out to a yard where it's just bars, people go, yeah, that's what you deserve. And I'm like, you know, like it's cr- I understand. I think being locked away, people don't understand just being locked away being strip searched at every location that you yeah, get to yeah, is just so demeaning De- and dehumanizing. And yeah. 100 And you're like, you know, I'm all for if you know that's the safety of things. But you gotta understand, I think the punishment in that alone, just being taken, your freedoms taken, and I think with this current global situation, people have understood the the yeah. situation of what it's like just to be in custody. And I think that in itself teaches someone to, to that would be if we started to change and shift our mentality we'll create a better reality around the human beings that we get out of custody because all we're doing is throwing them in there and that yeah that personal um reality turns into that person's personality and i think when you do that you you build a line and then they, the line comes out and eats something and they like oh you know this line's no good we're treating the line, we're not feeding the line. And once we, you know, feed the line properly, um, we might actually see a change in the behavior of the line in general. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we've got a different mentality to lock them away, throw away the key. For me, I was trying, I was elevating constantly, breaking in as um, distraction shopkeepers and making a huge amount of money that way. Um, going out the back opening station and putting the key back like nothing ever happened and then going into snatching money off counters into bank robberies. Have a look at that transition just in my own journey. And um, it was all about, and it was constantly big money and I was really well known within the system for doing that. But it's just, you know, support. for me, it was all survival. So please, like, you know, um, people understand it. And I don't say that in a big head way. I'm just giving you context to who the yeah. human being I was and where I am now. And, you know, until we, until some people started to show me different things, until I started to have other factors um, influence me, my mother passing away from cancer, as an example, having kids within my life, I wasn't able to see different a different light. And I learned how to role model myself. Um, what if you and these people that throw judgment or throw mud took two minutes to actually teach the person you're throwing mud at what you know, um, a good life uh, or good behaviors, values, morals, and beliefs, the ethics are actually within a normal life. And then that human being can set up their passion behind that life and follow it with everything that they got, that same transferable skill. 
I've spoken about, and you see, you know, so many successful people come out of um, the clink, and I think that's that's you know, um, all it takes is one person and one opportunity to create that change. Yep, all it takes is one person. All right, and um, yeah, for sure, you know, that's our mission out here. For sure, that's the mission on the show. You know, most definitely to get brothers outside and seeing brothers doing well. You know what I mean? Seeing people that have been there that are kicking goals in life and have, um, you know, made it out of that cycle, which is a definite achievement in itself, man. But um, mm-hmm. look to to sort of um, coming towards the end now. So, I mean, wh- where are you at right now, brother? So what, what are some things you're doing currently, man? Yeah, so as I said, um, I am a mental health and wellbeing consultant. We run habits and rituals workshops around the country, and I've spoken about who we deal with. I got an online program as a trainer. I became a nutritionist through uni, um, Deakin Uni, uh, and um, that got put into, you know, the same habits and rituals we had. Mate, we train like beasts within there, and I can tell you now, no one trains as hard as people that are in custody, whether you're out here or um, – and it's the same thing. If we took that same mentality into CrossFit, into competition, about, the you know, the highest end of um, any game because – we do push ourselves to the limit, but um, the online program's done really well. We dealt with over 100,000 people this year. Um, I got a few. I was interviewed five times this year for different TV shows. Um, four times I hid my past. The fifth time I went, F this, man, I'm just going to tell them because they keep finding out and they knock me back. So I spoke about it this time and said, hey, here's who I was, here's who I am now. Um, and looks like um, that's about the takeoff and um, next year everyone can see. Um, I'll give you a bit of a touch of a hint. The most athletic, uh, athletic version, the most determined version of myself really go at it. And, um, you know, that uh, from the bottom of my heart inspires other people to um, believe and achieve anything that they want in their life. And, you know, it doesn't. you don't have to go down the path of crime. Obviously, the show's about, um, the redemption stories and and all the stories of those that have been been in custody and um, I think anyone in any point of time in their life you can take the same storyline of you know struggle hardship whatever it may be trauma had plenty within my life and really start to create that change for yourself but you control you so until you stand up for yourself you're never going to get anywhere and um, on the back end of that we've got some huge things coming in um, 2022 and. Um, we're doing some really um, big things around community projects and I've got one big thing I want to do is a, a world record. Um, I really want to give that a crack. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, so it, it'll be a huge community project. That's all I'll say for now. Nice. Um, it's in the pipeline and things have, have been going and um, same thing, you know, I just I, I love for people that know me um, and those that know me from the area know that, I was that person and I am striving and it's changed so many lives on that journey. And uh, hopefully, you know, for those that do watch you, your podcast, it can change their life, even if you haven't been on that journey, but just to get out and stop making excuses and make sure that you control you and get it done. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Get it done. No excuses for sure. Um, um yeah, Jeffrey Morgan, man, much love, brother. Um, I'll leave your Instagram in the in the description below too. So um, you know, go follow him on Instagram. Um, keep keep your eyes on his journey. He's got some big things coming, a few exclusives next year. So can't wait for 2022 for you. Um absolutely. look, brother, I've enjoyed this chat, man. Thank you so much for jumping on and um wishing all the best for you, brother. Mate, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. And honestly, from the bottom of my heart, brother, um, if I'm ever in New Zealand, I'll look you up. Oh, brother, um, I got you, brother. And, yeah, and it'd be great to catch up. And um, your in- Instagram handle is Jeffrey Morgan Lifestyle Program, isn't it? Correct. And same website, um, pretty much www.jeffreymorgan.com. J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. Awesome, awesome. All right, much love, brother, and we'll talk soon. Much love, brother. Thanks for your time.